three. We'll do two more. Okay. Could you turn your head? That means all angles only. are the same. Uh, all angles. Are the same. Uh, okay. Going into is a livery stable. Which, okay. And that's for the horses. Yeah, well, sure. He had to put them somewhere. Put them somewhere. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> okay. And, and they. Well, Hi. And he owned it. In fact, President Grant <laughs> rolled together <laughs> last today. Um, was Barrett one of his clerks? Yes. Right. He was there during Brown versus Board. My name is Greg Peterson. I am the president of the Robert H. Jackson Center, and we are all joined here today for a celebration. This is a celebration of six years of growth of the Robert H. Jackson Center, which was organized in 2001 to advance the legacy of Robert H. Jackson through exhibits, educational activities, symposiums, and we've been able to accomplish much. It is also a celebration of the people who made this happen and the individual who planted a seed and nourished it to what we are today. A few housekeeping matters. Fire ex exits here, here, there. Fire code, Marshall is happy. Uh, due, due to certain time constraints, uh, Justice O'Connor will be meeting with the Board of Directors after the presentation and prior to her return to Chautauqua. So at our conclusion, if we could just stay in our seats as we depart to permit Justice O'Connor and the Board to exit, I would appreciate it. Also, everybody is invited to a lunch downstairs, which is wonderfully set up and uh, an opportunity to meet and greet all the variety of dignitaries who are here. I want to thank specifically Barbara Vacker of the Chautauqua Women's Club for having the foresight to extend the invitation to Justice O'Connor to come back to our area and for the support of the Chautauqua Women's Club for a variety of things that they, we've done here. Go to Barbara. <laughs> On to the celebration. Introductions are in order. Justice O'Connor, I would like to introduce you to a group, a very special group. <laughs> 
sum total of who are responsible for the Robert Jackson Center today. Who are these people? These are judges from the federal, state, and local level who continue to advance and enhance the cause of Justice Jackson in their particular world. I'll just call out one of them who traveled a great distance today to arrive with his daughter, and that is Judge Jeffrey Sutton from the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, who uh, I guess has argued a few times in front of you. <laughs> also lawyers, all of, all of who have dedicated their lives to advance the ethics and the principles of Justice Jackson and they have been a tremendous support for advancing the community activities here. And I'm thrilled with all the lawyers who are in attendance. There's a variety of individuals whose time, talents, and vision have lent community credibility to this project. Members of the local foundations, the support of which we, without which we would not be here today. As in any successful not-for-profit organization, it's the volunteers which are the backbone, and many of them are in our audience. Within the group of volunteers are members of the board of directors, which have been engaged at every level possible to advance the cause of the Robert Jackson Center. I just want to call out one of them, who traveled from Washington, D.C. to be here today, and that's E. Barrett Prettyman, Jr., who I understand has been your guru with regards to cinematic adventures. He's my movie preview. <laughs> How's he done? Well, it's so so. There. <laughs> All good with one exception. I think I heard about that one. And more importantly, for Barrett, and he probably doesn't want me to announce it, but that he's been selected by the American Lawyer, the most read monthly magazine for lawyers for its Lifetime Achievement Award and will be entering its Hall of Fame in October. And of course, Justice O'Connor, there's the staff, the backbone of the day-to-day -day operations of this operation, uh, which include Linda Cowan, Tracy Bogdan, Rich Fisher, Don Greenhouse, and the head of all activities, Carol Drake, who you met earlier, who had an encounter with a 200-pound deer this weekend, got out of the hospital and is today here to join us. So to Carol. And finally, this operation would have not ever gotten off the ground except for some individuals who need to be recognized. One is Elizabeth Linnae Fairbank, who was at the beginning, she was there with her time, talent, support, and original board member, her financial obligations uh, and, and commitment has just been extraordinary. So to Betty, thank you very much. <laughs> and right in lockstep with Betty was Carl Kappa. Carl Kappa, an industrialist extraordinaire and who became uh, a real rock bottom founder with Betty and unfortunately, Carl passed away in 2001, but Kay Cap is here, and Kay, uh, if I could just recognize you on behalf of the family, Kay. <laughs> and to my right and to Justice O'Connor's right is Juanita Bratton. Juanita Bratton and Dan Bratton were, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about both of them, but they were the ones uh, who really were right there from the get-go. It was Dan who provided the inspiration, the vision, the mission. And it was Dan through the, right up to the last days of his life, became very much part of what we are today at the Jackson Center. And Juanita, I'm so supportive of you and supportive of the fact you supported Dan right up to the very end. And so thank you, Juanita. However, we're here not to celebrate. We're, this is more than just the celebration of that group, Justice O'Connor. To you folks, I have the distinct privilege of introducing Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, whose tremendous accomplishments in a general sense are one we can all pause and celebrate, but also in a very specific sense, 
for what she's done for the Robert Jackson Center. We all know that on July 7th, 1981, President Reagan nominated her to be the first woman justice of the United States Supreme Court. She was confirmed 99 to nothing on September 21st, 1981. Did we find out who did not vote? Oh, we know who. <laughs> it was Senator Max Baucus, but he wrote me a nice letter and said he was sorry he couldn't be here. He would have voted yes. <laughs> Now you have it. <laughs> On September 25th, 1981, she was sworn in as the first American jurist and the first, American, or first female associate justice of the United States Supreme Court. A terrific honor, a terrific role model for all women in all areas. And she spoke about that eloquently yesterday at Chautauqua. She served with this distinction from that time period through January 31st, 2006. She has taken on many positions on her post-retirement days, including the Chancellor of William & Mary, and I saw that she was head of the celebration of Jamestown. I didn't know that the mayor had announced that here in Jamestown, New York, but that was very nice. But uh, then I read further, and it was uh, the 400th anniversary of, the, of Jamestown, and you had a chance to meet the Queen. Before I go to the story of the relationship, I was taken by Barbara Vacker's uh, introduction yesterday when she quoted your granddaughter. So to those who weren't there, uh, I want to share just these are comments of the granddaughter of Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor became the first woman to serve on the United States Supreme Court. And according to her, according to the granddaughter, grandma was a lawyer, a state senator, and a judge. She was such a good judge that, in 1981, President Reagan asked her to become a justice. Doing so, she broke the last glass ceiling in the legal profession and further opening doors for women in all areas. Went on to say that this was by Courtney O'Connor when she was nine years old, and she indicated some important information from a book she wrote, that Grandma and I like chocolate ice cream and frozen yogurt best. Her job is important, but she's also just a grandma, like everyone's else's grandma. And for those who have had a chance to be in her presence, it's just a delight that she's such a, a unique individual and very warm and compassionate. And she has wonderfully made herself available to this community, the Chautauqua community, and to the Jackson Center. And without going much further, I'd just like to tell a story, and then we're going to show a quick video, and then we have a presentation. Her husband, John O'Connor, had an early relationship with Chautauqua Institution. And I understand he was a dishwasher. That's what he claims. <laughs> I have yet to see evidence. <laughs> And through a relationship uh, between John and somebody, I think, in the Jamestown area, you vacationed here, had a chance to meet Dan and Juanita Bratton. And through that relationship, she was invited to do something which kicked us into a level here at the Jackson Center, which I, for one, would have never have guessed. And that was on, in August of 1996, she came down to Jamestown to dedicate the statue which is down on 8th Street uh, for Justice Robert H. Jackson. I was in the crowd, as were many others, and it was an opportunity to see the esteemed Justice O'Connor sprinkle some holy water on somebody from Western New York. And I got to tell you, it was a moving moment, and with her permission, she's, we're going to show just a few excerpts of that so you can see Justice O'Connor's own words about Robert Jackson. This week on America and the Courts, Justices Sandra Day O'Connor and Stephen Breyer. First, we'll feature Justice O'Connor at a statue dedication ceremony honoring former Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson. He was nominated to the court by President Franklin Roosevelt in 1941 
and served as an associate justice for 13 years. I'm honored and pleased to introduce the United States Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. This is a wonderful occasion for Jamestown and for all of us who are lucky enough to be here and see the unveiling of this absolutely handsome and strong statue of Justice Jackson. We're remembering today a product of this community and of its public schools. The most treasured honor that anyone can receive is one that comes from one's hometown, from those who knew the honoree first and best. So it is today. Robert Jackson, one of the finest justices ever to sit on the bench of the United States Supreme Court, grew up on a farm close to Jamestown. It was here that he attended the Jamestown Elementary and High School, that he married, had his children, and practiced law. It was here that he spoke in 1935 at the dedication of the new Jamestown High School building. He said then, if you believe, as I believe, that democracy is the form of government best adapted to our people, then you must regard the public school as the most fundamental concern of our society. Democracy will... Democracy will always call most of its leaders from the ranks of humble men, and to equip them, it must provide free education to the sons and daughters of disadvantaged homes. On graduating from Jamestown High School, Jackson read law in a Jamestown law office, spent one year in Albany Law School, and was admitted to the New York Bar at age 21. Now, this is the last justice of the Supreme Court to have gotten there without ever going to law school. That's an amazing record. <laughs> now, for a lawyer or a judge, reading a Jackson a Supreme Court opinion is a special treat. He wrote always with clarity with style and with persuasion. His opinions are just studded with wonderful passages and quotations. For example, he wrote of the court that we are not final because we are infallible, but we are infallible because we are final. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote strongly in support of individual liberties and in opposition to arbitrary government action. In his opinion for the court in Board of Education versus Barnett, which held a school child may not be compelled against his will to recite the Pledge of Allegiance, he said the very purpose of the Bill of Rights was to withdraw certain subjects from the vicissitudes of public controversy to place them beyond the reach of majorities and of officials. In the Korematsu case, upholding the wartime confinement of Japanese Americans in relocation camps, Justice Jackson dissented, saying, now if any fundamental assumption underlies our system, it is that guilt is personal, not inheritable. And of course, he was justified many years later by the common assumption that that opinion was, the majority opinion was wrong, and Congress finally rectified it many, many years later. President Roosevelt had promised to nominate Justice Jackson as Chief Justice when uh, Chief Justice Stone retired, but it never came to pass. President Roosevelt died and was succeeded, of course, by President Truman. Truman asked Justice Jackson to serve as chief prosecutor of the Nazi war criminals in Nuremberg in 1945. 
Jackson believed that the long months he spent in Nuremberg were the most important, enduring, and constructive of his life. After 10 months in this place and 17,000 transcript pages of testimony, 19 of 21 defendants were convicted and sentenced. As Jackson put it, the evidence is there with such authenticity and in such detail that there can be no responsible denial of these crimes in the future and no tradition of martyrdom of the Nazi leaders can arise among informed people. And he hoped to create a precedent that would make explicit that to persecute, oppress, and do violence to individuals or to minorities on political, racial, or religious grounds is an international crime. Today, 50 plus years later, the world is again witnessing an attempt to apply that precedent in new war crimes proceedings in Brussels and in Rwanda to serve again as the voice of human decency following the unspeakable tr atrocities in Rwanda and in Bosnia-Herzegovina. We're following the path beaten by Robert Jackson for the protection of basic human liberties. Robert Jackson is a product of this wonderful community, of its soil, of its people, its public schools. It was here that he learned his lifelong curiosity for knowledge and inspiration to seek self-improvement by hard work and the courage to take responsibility. He knew education was not the formal years of study, but a lifelong process. With your statue of this great man, you will help everyone who sees it to further his or her own inspiration and his or her own self-improvement. Congratulations to Jamestown and to all of you. Thank you. I was one of those folks in the crowd that day, as were several others who are here. And I think you laid down a gauntlet about the fact that he was a product of our community and it was a responsibility for our community to make sure that that legacy was not lost. I'm here to tell you that that seed you planted uh, has resulted in this Robert Jackson Center. And it's gone on even further because as I was mentioning, shortly after we got started, um, one Dan Bratton, who recently retired from Chautauqua Institution, was in an audience which consisted of Betty Lene and Carl Kappa and the members of the Jackson family. And we were talking about the possibilities. And the excitement got very intense, very fast. And all of a sudden, Dan Bratton, who was a spectator, said, I will be the executive director of this organization. And I think he was intent on going to Arizona and retiring. And I was excited that he was excited, which just sort of further got uh, the ball moving. And little did I realize that the next week, on a prearranged schedule, I had a meeting with you <coughs> at the Supreme Court. And he came back after he met with you and was telling the story, and I'll share it with all because it was the most exciting thing, excitement I've seen in Dan's face since I think the Mets won the uh, 1969 World Series. <laughs> and it was, in essence, this, that you asked him, Dan, what are you doing? And Dan's response was, well, I'm retired from Chautauqua Horse. No, Dan, what are you doing? And he said, well, this crazy lawyer, Jamestown Greg Peterson's got me excited about this Robert Jackson concept. And you told him, this is important, and this is what we are going to do. And as he told the story, he simply indicated that you reached underneath your uh, desk and handed him a legal pad. 
and then proceeded to dictate to Dan Braden, a sight of which I think we all would have loved to have seen. <laughs> and then proceeded to give him a one, two, three, four, five. He kept the notes. And he came back and described exactly what you told him one through five. One, invite William Rehnquist to an early occasion at the Robert Jackson Center. She, Justice O'Connor, will support the invitation directly with him. Have Rehnquist keynote a lecture on how to deal with genocide in terms of international sanctions. Um, invite Justice Richard Goldstone. Suggested two contacts, one David Wigdor. And he tells this story. You got on the phone, called the curator at the Library of Congress, David Wigdor, and as Dan related it, when you indicated that it would be wonderful if Dan could meet with him this morning, he said, you could hear the heels click on the other end of the phone. <laughs> and after that was set up, then you called the Supreme Court Historical Society, David Pride, and indicated why you probably have, wouldn't it be nice if you had time this after, early this afternoon for my good friend Dan Bratton, similar heels clicking, and all of a sudden there are three pages of Dan's report meeting with both of them. He came back with a sense of enthusiasm that in fact infused all of us, and we had board meetings literally weekly. That came back and you were just fertilized this concept, the seed, and it took another level. Another level is, and you, and is that we had a chance, and I look forward to an opportunity to have uh, the Robert Jackson Center work with the Supreme Court Historical Society and have Senator Christopher Dodd speak on his father and Justice Jackson at the Supreme Court. I thought, man, that would be really wonderful, but it requires the consent of a justice of the Supreme Court. So as it turned out, there were two of them. One. Uh, not so well Justice, Chief Justice Rehnquist and a Justice O'Connor, which permitted us to be in the well of the Supreme Court and I was nervous, but that was a big, big deal on our progression. So much has happened and every time you've come to Chautauqua, you've managed to put in a good word about Justice Jackson and it's, that has given us credibility, given us credibility locally, nationally, and now internationally. We're working with the city of Nuremberg. We're working with Moscow and various things. And it's all, frankly, because of something special that occurred in August of 1996. And you've continued that support in so many ways. So I, I just really wanted to pause and to say thank you. And at the same time, uh, give to you, present to you something we've only given out a, couple of times, one to Chief Justice Rehnquist and one to Barrett Prettyman, and we would like to do that now. So Juanita, if you could come forward. Justice O'Connor. And what this is, is a signed, signed lithograph of, uh, of portrait of Justice Jackson done by Laura Bell Colburn. And it is, the original is outside here, and we've only given it out three times, and we're honored to give it. I didn't expect all this today. I thought it was a quiet little visit, no speech, no, no nothing. And I'm so delighted to be here and to see what has transpired in this community with the opening of the Jackson Center. Now, we're in the livery stable right here. Right. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know horses lived so well. It's great. <laughs> but I'm thrilled to see this thing physically here and with the generous contributions of your donors who are here today, this is a great thing to do. You've already heard what I had to say some years back about Justice Jackson, but his legacy is enormous and it will never cease to be important. And I will never cease to marvel that someone from this community, a graduate of the elementary school and the public high school, 
without further education could go on to be one of the great justices of our Supreme Court. And he had such integrity and vision, and he had a way with words that's just remarkable. Now, I hope you'll figure out what he learned here in these public schools and try to teach some of the current generation <laughs> some of his incredible use of language and his ability to reason and understand. He has just left a remarkable legacy for all of us. And we're facing so many problems today, an era of terrorism, an area, a, a time when we're detaining people in Guantanamo Bay, and we have many legal issues to face, as do other nations around the world. And we can look back at some of his commentary to guide us in this new era. So you're doing a very good thing here in opening and maintaining and operating this Jackson Center. It does matter, and probably now more than it ever did. My former law school classmate was Bill Rehnquist, who became our Chief Justice. I think he was a wonderful Chief Justice, and I was in law school with him when he was hired as a law clerk by Justice Robert Jackson. And all of us, his classmates, were overjoyed that one of our class members was going to clerk the court, and we were thrilled that he clerked for Justice Jackson. He was followed the next year by Barrett Prettyman over here, who clerked for him. Now I'm gonna tell you a little humorous event when Bill, Bill Rehnquist told me that while he clerked for Justice Jackson, that Bill Rehnquist liked to go up to the highest court in the land that's the basketball court over the courtroom, <laughs> and play a little basketball occasionally with his co-clerks. They do that still, but we can't let him do it when court's in session. You can hear the ball bounce. But uh, he was up there in the late afternoon playing a vigorous game of basketball, and he understood that his justice, Justice Jackson, was not going to be in that afternoon. He, was seeing someone and he was going to be away. So Bill Rehnquist finished his game and he was all, well, what shall I say, hot and sweaty. And um, he decided to go back downstairs where the Jackson Chambers was and where Bill Rehnquist had his little section to sit as the law clerk. And the law clerks didn't have a shower down there in their, um, toilet area, but the justice did, because every justice's chambers is equipped with a shower. So knowing the justice was away, Bill Rehnquist marched right into the Justice Jackson shower and showered and got cleaned up, and he had a towel around himself to go back to his little space, and who should walk in the door but Justice Jackson with a guest? <laughs> And Bill Rehnquist was just mortified. He just couldn't believe what was happening. And he hastily apologized and made a speedy disappearance. And to his credit, to show you again the character of Justice Jackson, he didn't hold it against him. <laughs> so um, he had a, Bill Rehnquist had a great experience uh, with Justice Jackson and in turn, was able to share some of that legacy in the succeeding years when Bill Rehnquist himself served as an Associate Justice and later as Chief Justice. So I'm tickled to be here and to see all of you, members of this community and supporters of the Jackson Center. You are doing wonderful work. And Greg Peterson, you should be very proud of what you've achieved here. So thank you for this wonderful portrait. Now, don't expect me to carry it on the airplane. <laughs>
There is lunch downstairs for everyone, and if you would be so kind as to stay in your seat for a second while Justice O'Connor and the board uh, depart. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.